Hello everyone, and welcome to week 7 of Super Smash Bros. Singles for Photosage Esports. Um, apologies for the delay in the stream. We had a few technical difficulties going on, but things should be smooth sailing from here, and our first sets should be beginning very, very soon.
Alright, and it looks like the first set of the day is about to begin. We're going to be having Kerbo versus Light. Kerbo going the Captain Falcon and Light going Joker. Both these characters are more close range. However, Joker will have a slight advantage with the knife that will grant him a bit of disjoint on his attacks, although the general range should be somewhat the same considering that Captain Falcon does have longer limbs than Joker does. Um, both these characters want to get in on the opponent um, and run an offensive game plan. However, Captain Falcon is more focused on movement speed and Joker far more on attack speed. Oh, and we see here one of the other weaknesses of um, Kerbo is going to have to be contesting with is going to be Falcon's recovery, SDing on the very first stock um, due to a dash attack from light. Um, this character um, does not have the greatest recovery. Um, Joker, for what it's worth, does have a pretty good one. Um, however, Joker also has that X-Factor in his unique Arsene mechanic. As we can see here, it just activates. This will change the properties of both his normal and special attacks. Um, uh, we see here it turns his down special into a counter and increases the power of his projectile. Um, it just generally makes moves a bit better, with the one exception potentially being up special, which is that grappling hook that we saw him using earlier, which make it worse and worse. Um, or rather a grappling hook that he does have. You see here that um, side special will have an explosion effect with it, and without it we can clearly see the difference. It's a lot less knockback. Light has a commanding lead um, here going into the first game. Kerbo not able to take his very first stock. However, Light also appears to be struggling and taking curves without that SD. Absorbs the hit with the um, a counter stance there. That will um, basically absorb some of the damage when he is hit in that stance, and turn it directly into meter towards getting Arsene, and Joker with Arsene is arguably the best character in the game. However, Light appears to struggle to um, uh, finding a way to finish this out. Kerbo at 200% has incredibly high rage, and that counter is going to come in. One of the best counters in the game, if not the best, reflects both projectiles and regular attacks. Kerbo not finding a way to play around it. Light just standing back patiently zoning with projectiles and using dash attack as a get off me tool using that counter when necessary. Appears to be working. Kerbo's taking a huge amount of damage. Struggling to find a way back. Finally goes through the projectiles with the falcon kick. Goes for the forward air. Doesn't get it. Counters twice. Right as our send runs out we see that grappling hook. However that falcon kick is finally going to take it. Light finally loses his first stock. Kerbo though at 103.3% high likelihood he's not going to be able to make it out of this come back here would be very very difficult that being said lights um habits especially regarding that counter should be relatively predictable Kerbo's able to get it and for the second time in the set Kerbo sds light takes game one with a two stock now both these players um that was an interesting set um Kerbo sding twice obviously didn't help matters much and Light's game plan, while effective in that game one, is going to be very predictable and very easy, easy to adapt against. See, the thing with projectile spam is that when you're doing it just carelessly like that, it's going to be very easy to shield and very easy to move around. Kerbo struggled with that in the first game, however I guarantee by the second game he's going to have that pinned down a bit more. So just using the same move over and over again with the same timing is going to be a lot harder. And randomly using counters like that. Well, it might seem like a good idea, is also going to be very, very risky because if your opponent um, wants to start a combo against you, the easiest thing they could do is just throw you. We saw that earlier um, in stock one where Kerbo simply threw Joker when he attempted to counter and it went right through it because counters only work against regular hits. Um, and the, the second option is to just punish them with a combo starter after the fact because counters aren't actually active during their entire duration and the third potential way he can avoid them is going to be just through charging smash attacks especially at hyper sense it's going to be very effective charging smash attacks letting the counter play out and then punishing that recovery with a now significantly more charged smash attack which deals more damage and by extension knockback instead of going captain falcon for game two though Kerb is going to switch to incineroar this character similar up close game plan however how he goes about getting there it's going to be very different because unlike captain falcon Incineroar is arguably the slowest character in the game, however he makes up for it by being the most powerful and one of the most volatile due to that right there. That is Revenge, and as we see here, taking him from 4 to 61 in a single hit, Revenge will absorb anything that hits with and will immediately increase the damage of Incineroar's next attack. Uh, Incineroar also um, has that Darkest Lariat, 
which is a project was a is a command grab so similar to regular grabs as i mentioned earlier that will go through counters so too will that um he also has some very good long lasting kill moves um in that darkest lariat neutral special the one where he spins around that lasts a very long time as does that we see instant 50 percent off a single hit Blight has our send now, however, he is down a stock, gets hit with another Lariat, even without Revenge, that move is still incredibly powerful. Kerbo probably switched to Incineroar specifically because of how Revenge works against projectiles. Um, because you can absorb projectiles, that will increase his damage. Using projectiles against Incineroar too heavily is going to be very ill-advised. Kerbo, nearly at 150%, essentially has max Rage right now. Rage is a um, sort of comeback mechanic in this game where... At 150%, um, as your percent increases, your knockback increases. It maxes out at 150% with 10% knockback overall being increased. Combine that with Incineroar's kill power, and we have a very, very dangerous character on the field right here. That is going to be massive instant 61. Kerbo, also using Incineroar's high weight here, this character does not die very easily one of the heaviest characters in the game however that dash attack boosted by our son is going to be enough to kill finally take kerbo's first stock however light here um uh, light here now finds himself in a similar position that kerbo found himself in the ending of game one he has a massive comeback to make however light uh, seems to try to be doing it however he does get caught out by the alolan whip just barely survives the lariat attack Hits him with another one, though. However, he misses the input. That move requires that you input the button again at a specific time in order to get specific follow-ups. However, that down smash is going to be more than enough. Joker is not a heavy character, and that is going to be the second game as Kerbo takes it back with the Incineroar counterpick. That was a very, very good choice on Kerbo's part. Kerbo tends to go Incineroar against characters where he has trouble dealing with projectiles because... It is going to be, this is online, so movement isn't going to be the smoothest thing in the world, so dodging projectiles by just jumping over them or like narrowly weaving in and out of projectile spam is going to be a lot more difficult online than it's going to be off. So if he has a character who can basically just shut down projectile game plans on a whim like Incineroar can, that's going to be like a huge factor for comebacks. Um, and it's worked very well in the past so far with Kerbo and it appears to be working very well here. Incineroar just punishes those kinds of mind that kind of mindless projectile use. Um, Light's going to have to adapt. He's going to have to start mixing up these options because predictable counters can just get either Alolan whipped or smash attacked or simply just grab regular combo thrown. Um, Incineroar's down throw can lead to some combos at low percents and just general follow-ups. Um, and he's going to have to play around movement a lot more. Staying still against Incineroar is very ill-advised. The last thing you want is for him to be able to approach a almost not moving target. That is the last thing you want. Part of Incineroar's main weakness is that approaching you is going to be very difficult. So more defensive play where you force him to come to you um, is going to allow you to set the pace of the match to sort of dictate where he moves. Um, and while the Revenge can throw a bit of hitch in that, it can still be avoided um, and actually countered um, in the exact same way that um, Kerbo can counter lights. Um, the Joker has good combo throws, um, and even just regular throws for positioning are going to be useful. And more importantly, Light can go for more throws because Incineroar's Revenge will actually um, be lost in three ways. If he hits the opponent, he takes too much damage, or if he's fully thrown. If the opponent hits Incineroar with a throw, that is going to remove Revenge. So going into game three here, Lights may want to look for more of those as he switches to Pyra slash Mithra, known by the community as Aegis, reflect um uh, or Pithra, colloquially. Um, these are essentially two characters in one, and they have one big advantage in this matchup, and that's going to be range. They will massively outrange Incineroar here. Um, however, um, that's not to say they aren't without weakness. The biggest problem they're going to face is going to be their recoveries. These characters are have a very hard time making it back to stage. And also because their hitbox of solar is going to be a lot more easy to revenge. After a single revenge boosted forward smash, Kerbo has, almost e has actually gained the lead after losing for basically the entirety of the first stock. Light seems to be just trying to be using special moves, and Kerbo can combo break with revenge. However, he's not going to be able to combo break that time. Light does take the first stock with Pyra. 
um, among these two characters, Pyra is going to be the slower and harder hitting of the two, while Mithra is going to be the faster but weaker version. Here we can see here, um, her size B is that sort of advancing dash. It's just going to make a lot of use out of um, Pyra's special moves, trying to zone Incineroar out. Oh, boop, baiting him out with the invincibility. Um, that switch will give him a slight amount of invuln. Um, however, Kerbo could probably play around that. It's going to be, seems to be switching between the two a lot. Side special, just whiffs it. However, hits him with um, Mithra's own up special. Light tries to go for it, however, does get caught up by the Incineroar down air. That move is a ton of downwards knockback. And even with the small amount of knockback that is lost by bouncing up against the stage, he's still going to be more than enough to kill him against the top. That said, Light does have a comfortable lead. However, Incineroar is going to be the one character in the game who can reliably make comebacks. Or at the very least, he makes them the best of any characters in the game. Due to stuff like this, instant 83% after one interaction. And that forward air, as we can see here, that it comeback factor from Incineroar... Kerbo has been losing almost the entire game, now has the lead, and potentially has the tools to just end the set right there, and that's going to do it. An SD from Light mirroring the several SDs from Kerbo game one is going to decide that set as Kerbo takes it back with a comeback using Incineroar, winning the set 2-1. to one.
All right, and it looks like the second set of today is about to begin. Um, we're going to have Sarah Benito Fan versus Master of Characters playing under the Esports 2 tag. Master of Characters going um, Corin and Sarah Benito Fan going as um, Classic Byleth. Uh, Sarah is going to have the advantage, at least in terms of range. Byleth does have excellent range on most of her attacks. Um, however, Corin is probably going to outmatch her in speed, both in movement and attack speed, as well as general mobility, thanks to that pin special that we've been seeing a bit of. Um, that is going to give Corin a few follow-up options, mainly that kick that we've been seeing quite a lot of, um, and is just generally good as a mobility tool and a spacing tool. See, so he doesn't know what to do, he cancels it out right there. Um, Corrin has a couple other unique mechanics, primarily from her projectile. It will stun the opponent in place, and up close has a melee hitbox that deals very high amounts of knockback. Oh, goes for the down air spike. That's another thing that Corrin has unique to her. Um, her down air will is a multi hit that sends both of um that sends will both send her and her opponent downwards. Um, as we can see here, it can be used. Um, for to force stock trades. However, that was probably not a Master of Characters' best interest, as um, uh, they did have the lead. However, that being said, they've been absolutely dominating the second stock. Sarah's not been able to find an opening. A Master of Characters almost uncontested 106.9%. Goes for the pin, however, he does get stuffed out by the dash attack, gets hit with the um, projectiles. As we can see here, the stun that projectile is so much that it actually can allow Corrin to follow up afterwards. Sarah now in a last stock situation, only having 27% of Master of Characters second. This is going to be one heck of a hill to climb. That said, Byleth might have the power to be able to pull it off, but he's going to have to play very carefully around Master of Characters tools. Shielding a lot of stuff, however, doesn't find any out shield punishes, gets caught out by the dash attack. Just barely misses the side special, needs to space these out more if he wants to press his advantage. Goes to the projectile, however, the arrow just barely gets avoided. Does hit with a weak hit of forward smash, though. Strong hit there. Um, especially at this percent around the ledge will probably be enough to kill. However, whether or not he'll actually be able to land that is another question entirely. Goes for however goes in the wrong direction, beats out the projectile with um the side special, goes for the down air. However, gets caught out by the reverse kick of pin. Um, that will actually have several follow ups, including um a sort of um behind him version. Oh, and Sarah runs off the stage. Not sure what that was. Might have been a controller misinput. But either way, Sarah is going to lose the first game as Master of Characters takes game one. So both players um, played that game well enough, aside from that um, last minute. I think it was a controller malfunction from Sarah Benito fan. Um, we had a few problems um, getting the stream started up. Uh, Tiffinator81, um, because the laptop actually um, logged itself out. Um, however, things should be working now. So that last game... It was interesting. Master of Characters would um did um run circles around Sarah. Um, especially that um was a brutal stock too. 
uh, for both of them. Master of Characters was really um, a, utilizing Corrin's speed advantage very, very well there. Um, that is one of the things about Byleth. They, um, they do not have a lot of fast attacks. Um, so that um, uh, advantage in frame data is going to be a huge factor um, in Sarah's loss. If Sarah wants to win this game, he's going to have to um, uh, play a bit more to Byleth's strengths, um, projectiles, and range. Um, because that is something that, um, outside of potentially pin, Corrin will have trouble contesting. Um, both characters are relatively slow projectiles. Corrin's might be able to contest it. However, the end lag on it is going to be a um, big thing for him to watch out for. Because it has that melee hit, um, it allows it to get close range kill confirms. However, it also means that just using it as a projectile, especially at the higher charge levels, is going to be very, very difficult because it just has so much end lag to it. Um, Sarah could basically trade projectiles with them, recover first, and gain in some space to emphasize his game plan. Um, this is especially would be especially useful considering the range at which Byleth excels. Um, that character is a mid-range character, which means that projectiles are generally not going to be as good because while well, they may be less reactable than they would be from full stage, um, they are not going to have quite the same range advantage, and if they hit, you're not going to get as much reward off of them. They're not going to be nearly as safe. They're going to be very, very unsafe at that range. You can kind of just stuff them out with your normals. However, it doesn't look like that's going to matter. Sarah's going to counterpick to Lucina, a character I'm not aware if he plays or not. I don't think I've ever seen Sarah go Lucina. Um, however, this character is widely considered to be very, very good. Um, one of the best in the game. Very simple, very basic game plan. Um, space, just space out with the sword, and just generally use solid fundamentals in order to control neutral. It appears to be working. Sarah does have a tight lead going into the first stock. However, it is a somewhat small one. Of Lucina, unlike her counterpart Marth, um, has even damage all throughout her sword. There are certain characters like Marth who where certain hitboxes on the tip of the sword do more damage, and other characters like Roy, where the base of the hitbox does less, um, does more damage. However, Lucina's is going to be a lot more um, evenly spaced. She doesn't have any um, sweet or sour spots. Her moves are very consistent. Um, and this is going to be one of the things that just generally Lucina's good at, which is consistency. She has high speed, actually might outspeed Corrin very slightly, um, in terms of, um, definitely in terms of movement and potentially in terms of frame data. Um, however, that he does have a bit of problem with range against Corn. As Corn has a couple attacks, which will outrange Lucina, is mainly that forward smash and that pin. That sweet spot forward smash, strongest at the tip, is going to be enough to take Sarah Benita fans first stock. However, Sarah is going to come back with a forward air, using a forward air off stage with the edge guard. That's going to take a master of characters first stock. Both players are relatively even footing. Shields the pin, doesn't get the punish, gets countered, however. Um, Corrin and Lucina both have a counter attack. We see him trying to go for it there. Corrin sends upwards and Lucina sends outwards, which means that Sarah's is going to be better for edge guarding purposes because it will send the opponent away from the stage, and Corrin's is generally going to be better um, from a killing perspective because upward sending moves will essentially always kill at the same percents regardless of stage positioning, especially on a stage like Final Destination where there aren't any platforms to interfere. Sarah struggling, has a slight deficit, however, could make it up with just one good neutral exchange. Here we can see them, um, a master of characters goes for the melee hit, just barely is out of range for it. Um, that would have taken Sarah a stock if it had connected. However, now that Sarah's a second lease on life, he might be able to make a count. Tries going for the counter read, however, doesn't go for it, and gets hit with the reverse kick, just barely not enough to kill. Sarah tries going for the back arrow, he's a bit too high. Oh, tries going for the forward smash. That might have killed Lucina's forward smash. Isn't particularly strong, but it is going to be very, very fast. That back air from Master of Characters, though, is going to be enough to kill. Goes for the forward smash. Not enough. Tries going for the edge guard, or advises against it. Hits him with a down tilt off stage. Oh, tries to go for the dash attack. Not a very good move from Lucina. Forward tilt is generally always going to be better. However, that is going to um, end Master of Characters' second stock. Both char players now on even stocks. However... Sarah Bonita fan struggling to find an opening, is still losing, however, hits with a forward air off stage, doesn't go for the follow-up forward air, that might have been enough to end the set. Um, Corrin's recovery does have some limited range, albeit it is still about average for this game. 
Forward Air Shield is going to be pretty safe. Hits him with a reverse hit of Down Smash. Gets caught out by the counter yet again. Master of Characters getting really, really good at predicting when Sarah's going to go for those aggressive approaches. Sarah hits him with the back air, waiting for him to act out of the pin. Gets caught out by the down air, though. Uses pin once again, shielding, waiting for him to do something. Counters it, isn't able to get a follow-up. Gets caught out by that follow-up of the pin the one time he doesn't wait for it. Patiently goes back to ledge, hits him with the down air. Gets caught out by the projectile, though. Ends his momentum. Hits him with the first forward flash off stage. This could be enough. Either player could be in range to win this. They're both at kill percents, and Sarah is in an aggressive, um, advantage advantageous position. Both players return to neutral. He's trying to find an opening. Gets hit with a down smash yet again. And goes for the forward air edge guard. Just enough knockback to take that final stock. With the Lucina counter pick unexpected, a Sarah Bonita fan retakes game two. Sets now one to one. Master of characters um, with the Corin potentially see a counter pick. I'm not aware if he or if um, they play any other characters. Um, however, that was an excellent game. Sarah Bonita fan was on the back foot for almost that entire set. However, at that very, very end of that uh, last stock in game two, he finally pulls together. He was on match point there. That must have been very, very stressful. Um, and props to him for being able to keep everything together under the pressure. Um, if Le Master of Characters had hit him with any of his smash attacks or any of those, like, any more of those kicks, he would have lost the set. If Master of Characters had hit him with that just barely misspaced neutral special, he would have lost the set. Um, and that is something that Master of Characters may want to keep in mind. Um, are those confirms into kills and being able to close out stocks because an inability to close out stocks did end up being his undoing in that game too. A Sarah Bonita fan making the very close comeback. Um, Lucina is a... He did utilize Lucina's advantages pretty well. Generally stay in his own range um, while trying to stay out of that very slight mid-range where his attacks are unable to connect but Corrin has certain attacks which can um, because there is a range um, a bit farther away where Lucina can just there are certain things that Corrin can do that Lucina just cannot contest because they just have more range than she does um, however he played around that very effectively utilized Lucina's speed that was a big thing um, one thing we haven't seen a lot of is Lucina's whiff punishing um, see, in this game, it's generally advised to let your opponent do an attack. Um, they think you're going to hit you, however, you move out of the way right on time. Let them whiff an attack, and while they're still in the end lag of that attack, come back in and then punish them for doing it. Uh, Lucina is one of the best whiff um, punish characters in the game, especially at high percents, thanks to her forward smash. Uh, her forward smash isn't the strongest smash attack in the world, however, it is very, very fast. Um, that's not to say that it's necessarily safe or good to throw out in neutral, but as a whiff punish tool especially, that move is going to be very, very useful. Um, could also potentially stuff out those pin um, mix-ups, because if Corrin simply cancels the pin, forward smash is going to catch it out. Um, and I believe Lucina's forward smash would probably be able to beat out um, Corrin's kick. See, the thing with um, forward smash are just rather sword moves in general in this game, is that they are almost always going to be better than an equivalent move that uses a melee hitbox, or rather a um, limb hitbox. This is because of hurtboxes. Hurtboxes are the things that are able to get hit. And obviously, a sword is not part of a person's body, therefore they aren't able to get hit. Um, those kicks that we see from Corrin's pin, while they are very, very strong, they are technically limb hitboxes, meaning they are technically limb attacks, meaning that her legs will have hurtboxes on them, and Lucina's moves, some of, a lot of Lucina's moves, well, actually all of them, including her forward smash, which again is very good for whiff punishing and interrupting things, um, is a sword attack, meaning that it does not have those hurtboxes. So basically any melee attack is going to be able to get caught out by sword attacks like that. Going back to Final Destination uh, for this Game 3, Sarah has a very slight deficit, however, one or two hits could be able to, even if we see her hits it with a dash attack, gets caught up by the forward air, trades his own forward air in return. Both players are trying to find an opening. Master of Characters is going to find it. Combos projectile, follows it up into the pin, goes for another forward air. Finally has a lead, however, does get count caught out by the counter. P 
pins back to stage though. Sarah trying to find an opening, hits him with the forward smash as punish, forward airs him off stage, and that might be enough. Yep, that's going to be it. Corrin just does not have the range on his rec um, her recovery. Um, as Sarah Benita fan takes Master of Character's very first stock, just excellent use of Dolphin Slash there. Lucina's up special to avoid that projectile. Forward him off stage once again, goes for the dash attack, um, just barely misses out. Um, does hit the weak hitbox of uh, down air, have trades with the forward smash with their own in the opposite direction, and that counter, once again, as I said, that Corrin counter is going to be ideal for killing because it sends upwards. Um, doesn't matter what stage position it's going to be, so long as you're not off stage, that is going to be a kill at that percent. However, Sarah Benina fan does have a decent lead, it's going to forward smash charge it, gets caught out by the counter. Situation like this, Sarah would probably do best just to let it rip and not let them counter in return. Master of Characters does make it back to ledge. Sarah Bonita fan choosing to instead go for some ledge trapping. Predicts the jump, however, gets caught up by the forwarder anyway. Counters through it, however, the counter doesn't have a large enough hitbox to get it boxed out. All of a sudden, Sarah finds himself on the back foot. Is he able to barely regain control? Corrin, he will have to watch out when up against Corrin, especially above Corrin. Corrin's up air is a good kill move. Um, relatively safe and very large hitbox. Sarah just playing around, trying to space him out. Predicts the counter and forwards him, forward airs him off. Gets caught out by the um, up special from Corrin. However, Sarah just barely makes it back. Doesn't fall for it. However, does get hit that melee hitbox of the projectile. Master of Characters predicts the aggressive forward air back down. Sarah gets hit by the forward air um, projectile. He's going to want to um, end this stock off as quickly as possible. Avoids it. Wave punishes it with a forward air. Not enough to kill. Let's let it wait for him to do something. Predicts the jump, hits him with another forward air, still not quite enough to kill. Goes for the edge guard, however, does get caught out by the up special. Has to up special back himself. Gets hit by the sweet spot. That might just be it. Isn't able to air dodge back. Sarah Bonita fan was had the lead almost that entire game. However, a master of characters takes advantage of the fact he wasn't able to close out that stock quickly enough and results in a two stock. Um, a master of characters taking the set two to one.
All right, and it looks like the third game of the day is about to begin shortly. Sarah Bonita fan versus Stormy. Sarah Bonita fan once again playing Byleth, and this time Stormy's going to be playing Pokemon Trainer. Um, one of the most complex characters in the game, simply because it's technically three characters in one. Um, Squirtle is going to be a lot faster and a lot more combo-centric. Um, uh, Ivysaur is going to have a ton of range and be good in the neutral. And Charizard is going to be... Um, uh, have the best recovery is going to be the heaviest and is going to have the most kill power at the expense of speed. Um, here we can see here Squirtle already off to a bit of a rough start, not able to do much against Byleth's range. That is going to be one of um, Squirtle's weak points. Um, however, he does have incredibly high amounts of speed, so once he manages to get in, he might be able to stay in there for a very, very long time. However, it looks like Stormy playing under the tag Mario Pro um, is more content to just sit back trying to use aggressive special moves to approach. It doesn't appear to be working. Perhaps as well as he's intended, only dealing 42% so far, not able uh, to find a really strong opening to get some, to lay some good damage down. This for her barely misses, and that second hit of that down smash from Sarah Bonita fan is going to be enough. Um, Stormy now on his second stock, switches to Ivysaur because it switches automatically upon death. Flare of Lich is against the edge of the stage, nearly SDs, however, is able to make a bath, trying to approach with Charizard. Um, Flare Blitz will eat through a lot of things, however, it's unsafe on shield, and more importantly, it actually deals recoil damage to Charizard. He will take some percent whenever he uses it, um, so it's a move that isn't advised to be spammed. That being said, it is going to be very strong and does travel a very large amount of distance very quickly. As you can see here, a ton of knockback, not even 70%. It hits, and at 71%, Cerebonina fan will already die to it. That's how strong that move is. There's a reason it deals recoil damage. Looks like Sarah's trying to zone him out with projectiles just to avoid that Flare Blitz as much as possible. Avoid aggressive approach. Both players playing more passively. Sarah is going to hit him with the arrow. Oh, forces him to up special. That's going to put him in a lot of landing lag. Flare Blitz is back to stage. Is relatively safe after that. Trying to zone out with forward tilt. Uses up special as an out of shield option. Um, up specials and up smashes can be used instantly out of shield. You don't have to drop the shield first. You can just cancel it with them, which makes them... Um, really good for getting the opponent off of you. However, he Flare Blitzes into the stage, gets put in the recoil animation, and actually gets hit by the arrow, taking his second stock. Stormy now on his final stock with Squirtle. Um, doesn't appear to be manually switching Pokemon um, outside of switching out of Ivysaur to go into Charizard in that second stock, choosing to just try playing all of them until the time comes. Side B's off stage and accidentally SDs that move cannot be jump canceled in the air. Um, when used below the stage, it is basically guaranteed death. Sarah Bonita fan with a pretty dominant game one going in here. Um, Stormy does have a lot of tools available. I feel like he's not, they're not really using Pokemon Trainer to their full potential because Pokemon Trainer thrives off of being able to adapt to situations and because they don't seem willing to switch out characters, that huge aspect of Pokemon Trainer's gameplay has just been completely shafted. Uh, mainly going to be the lack of Ivysaur is going to be the thing that worries me the most. Ivysaur is probably the character, or at least the Pokemon, who would do the best in this situation because Ivysaur's main thing is that she has range and um, uh, she has the like speed to be able to use that range. She's not like abhorrently slow. She's not fast, but she isn't slow. And the fact that her range is so good and the fact that her neutral is so good, um, is a huge factor as to why Pokemon Trainer was one of the best characters in the game for a large span of time. Um, Ivysaur did get nerfed, however, Pokemon Trainer is still very, very good, um, and Ivysaur is around, um, even with the other ones. Charizard is generally agreed upon to be a bit worse than Squirtle and Ivysaur, however, it is still pretty close. Um, Ivysaur, um, has a lot of moves that would be very helpful against Byleth. Um, Side B Razor Leaf is a projectile, a very, very good projectile that Ivysaur can sort of um, use to cover her own approach because she recovers fast enough and the projectile is slow enough to where she can basically move with it. So she can do things while the projectile um, cuts off a certain amount of space. Uh, she has good spacing tools, back air and forward air both have very high range. Um, down air has become an infamous move for its ability to spike. Um, however, instead of going Pokemon Trainer and using the more neutral-focused uh, aspects of his kit, he's instead choosing to go Ness. 
Uh, this character has a very, very different playstyle. Uh, Ness has a lot of very good projectiles. The main one we're probably going to be seeing here is PK Fire. Goes for it right there. Um, if that move connects with the opponent, um, it will create a pillar of fire that essentially entraps them for a short period of time. However, Ness does have a couple weaknesses. The main one's going to be that recovery, as we see there. That is technically Ness's up special. Oh. Um, I'm not sure what they're going for here. It looks like they might be just Rage SDing, trying to recover back. Um, does that count? I'm not sure if that counts. Um... Was it the... I'm not sure if that was a wrong stage or if that was a rage quit that we just saw there. Uh, one moment, please. Okay, turns out there were no technical difficulties. There was no, like, mishandled stage. That was just a flat-out rage quit. Um, while it's not the most common end to a set, um, I suppose that means Sarah Bonita fan takes the set 2-0 with a never-before-seen uh, JV4 stock in the second game. Um, for those of you who are not aware, a JV is whenever someone... Um, wins a game with 0% damage, and the number is one more than the number of stocks that they currently have remaining. For example, a JV2 stock would be if they had 0% with one stock remaining. A JV3 stock is if they have two stocks remaining and 0%, and a, obviously, JV4 stock if they have three stocks remaining, and they have 0%. Uh, so that is going to be the end of that set again. Um, I guess a uh, Sierra Bonita fan takes it 2-0. to zero. All right, unfortunately, we will be joining this um, game mid-set. Uh, two games have already been played so far. Um, Kerbo won the first game. I was gonna, this is going to be Kerbo versus Joey Macaroni. Kerbo won the first game, and Joey Macaroni won the second. So we're going to game three here.
Turbo going to be playing Incineroar, and Dory McMurray is going to be playing Min Min. Uh, we've already explained Incineroar, however, Min Min is a very, very peculiar character. As you see, she has both those arms, and unlike most characters in this game, her arms are actually controlled... They're essentially a second set of, motion of normals that are controlled by the special button. Um, uh, her right arm, I believe it is... Um, actually, no, her left arm is going to use the normal attack button and is going to be the same regardless. However, her right arm is going to be a selection of three different arms. Currently has the disc equipped. That is going to be the faster but weaker one. Um, and that's going to be mainly useful in neutral as well as for range because it also has the most mobility of any of the arms that Min Min has access to. Um, that main arm, the one that's unable to change, is, equivalent, is identical to to the equipable dragon arm um that's the more well balanced one it has the unique beam attack as we see here taking her very first stock that beam gives it extended range um and when min min throws the opponent it will actually power up the beam to deal more damage more knockback and automatically home in on the opponent um and third i'm not sure if we're going to see it but joey macaroni also has access to a sort of mace like electric beam not electric beam, um, electric arm, which is going to have the worst mobility but deal the most damage. Kerbo accidentally SDs that second stock. Kerbo has a massive um, comeback to make here in game three. However, any character could do it, it would be Min Min. We haven't seen a lot of revenge so far this game. Um, it's kind of surprising, especially in this matchup where you think it would be very good. However, Kerbo is going to be able to take that um, first stock from Joey Macaroni with the um, Alolan Whip Lariat. Here we see you're using that disc to just control space. Kerbo not able to make it in. Incineroar may not have been the right choice here. Just barely avoids it. Isn't able to revenge. Goes for the Alolan Whip. Finally gets it. And down here is off stage. Kerbo still at a massive percent deficit. However, now has a real chance. Going up against um, we see finally equipped the mace. That Nair is going to be something to watch out for. Usually the mace's uh, smash attacks are thought to be the most scary. However, that neutral air is going to be relatively fast for a, um, a heavy attack and is going to deal a ton of knockback. There's him off stage. Goes for another down air, trying to end off the set with an edge guard. Just take his stock early. However, he gets launched off stage himself. And Cinderella has a very bad recovery. And that flame is going to do it. The extended laser from Joey Macaroni is going to take Kerbo's final stock. And the game three, taking it two to one.
All right, unfortunately, we will be joining a, another match mid-set. Uh, here we have game two of Swerzy versus SCP playing under the tag um, GV Esports. Swerzy playing typical Steve and SCP going to be going Link, not a character you see very often. Now, Steve is a character of complexity. Most of his normal attacks, actually basically all, almost all of them, uh, will change depending on his materials. You can see the little gauge above his character icon in the bottom left. Um, and he also has the ability to place blocks on stage. He can use up materials using most of his moves. Um, his down throw, his side special, his down air, as you can see there, all use iron to gain increased effects. Um, and those normals you see here will change depending on what um, a tool he's crafted. He'll start out with wood, however he can utilize his iron, uh, stone, gold, or diamond reserves to make better tools. Um, and Steve's main game plan is just going to be to zone the opponent out, get good resources, specifically get diamond, and then um, just absolutely wreak havoc with extremely high damage combos. And you can see here, Swerzy already has a decently built up lead for himself. That minecart going to be has become an infamous move um, in recent times due to how just Im near impossible to punish it is and how hard it is to deal with. Um, as we can see here, Swerzy using a ton of uh, the little intricacies of Steve. Um, the blocks that Steve is able to place will also use up his resources, um, and certain moves will actually interact with them differently. For example, um, anvils will stop falling and actually return falling with the similar power to they had before. Um, when a block is when they're placed on a block and that block subsequently breaks, um, one of Steve's biggest boons is going to be um, his recovery. Steve has a very very good recovery. As we can see here, is able to make it back even from the furthest steps of the stage. That's only using one of these recovery tools. Contrary to what Swerzy usually does, he doesn't wait to use Diamond in the second stock. Instead, he chooses to use it in the first. Very unusual. However, he might be looking to gain a early lead. Goes for it. Goes for the down throw into the forward air spike, and that's going to be enough. Link's recovery not sending him high enough in order to get him back. Link will be able to outrange Steve, however... That might not matter because Steve is just so much faster. He's just able to move all around all of Link's hitboxes. Uh, we also don't see SCP using any of Link's projectiles. One of the ways he might be able to contest Link, um, uh, Steve from a distance. Oops, where is he using his blocks? Finally gets back to stage. Still has diamonds on deck, so any combo star here could potentially be lethal. And we see here strings the elytra the weak hit of the elytra into the forward smash the diamond forward smash is going to have a ton of knockback it's going to be more than enough in a dominant game two as far as he takes a set Step into the ring! Alright, and for the third time in the row, we're going to be joining a game mid-set. We have Biggie Cheese playing under the tag Esports1 versus Sarah Bonita Fan. 
Um, Biggie Cheese did take game one. Uh, so we're going to be going into game two here. Um, potentially, maybe be one game. Hopefully, it's two. Uh, a fan. Going to be going Captain Falcon and Biggie Cheese going Falco. Uh, Falcon, we've already went over. Well, Falco is an interesting character. Most of his two, kit is going to revolve one, around one key go. move, and that's going to be up tilt. Um, up tilt, you can see him already using it here. This is a huge combo starter. It's a great anti air. It's very fast, and um, it gives Falco some of the longest and most crazy damage output in the game. He has very, very good combos off it, leaving it at most percent. Um, for what it's worth, Captain Falco can also get his fair share of combos. I mean, Falco is going to be lighter. Captain Falcon is a pretty heavy character given his mobility. However, he does have a bad recovery. Um, that being said, he could also be the same in reverse. So, you're going to want to avoid that. However, um, Biggie Cheese is going to back here him off stage to take reverse stock. Use him when he doesn't get the follow up out of the up tilt that he was looking for, though. As Nary goes for the Raptor boost, Biggie Cheese has a massive lead, only 32% from the deck so far. Sarah gets anti air once again. Four tilts clash, however, Sarah does get the frame advantage, doesn't get punished off of it. Goes for the down air edge guard. Sarah waits for him to get back off stage and uses his side B in order to get back on. Um, that move will go a very, very far distance. It doesn't go through shields, though, so if you do shield, it's going to be very unsafe. Sarah drives after boosting, speaking of unsafe, doesn't get the punish on it, though. Biggie Cheese does back air, goes for the edge guard, gets caught out by the Falcon dive. Took the laser. Um, well, that's a very, very long range projectile. Decently fast, um, and while it doesn't do much, it can prevent the opponent from going as much. Well. Oh, finally gets a follow up off of the up to It is technically possible to make two up tilts at low percents. Um, however, Biggie Cheese might just be going for more clean conversions. However, does finally hit the spike on that down air. Biggie Cheese with a three stop. Oh, oh, the second we had the second enough two. already? Step into the ring! Alright, we're actually going to be able to catch a full set this time. We're going to have Kerbo versus Dawn 64. Dawn 64 going Falcon, and Kerbo's going to be going the Incineroar. Uh, these characters don't want to get close to the opponent, however, Captain Falcon definitely has more tools to do so. That being said, he does make it. Um, account of big less when he does get in because it's similar to have that massive damage output and comeback potential, both thanks to revenge and just generally having high damage and knockback. back. As we can see here, after a single conversion, Incineroar already has a slight lead. Um, Falcon relies on the power to be able to do that, but like a bit of lag happens or trying to speed it up. And down airs him in the edge guard. Kerbo takes the very first stock, um, only having taken 52% of himself. Hits him with a strong livery to the Lolan Whip. And Dawn64 accidentally SDs. It looks like he was trying to grab ledge there. However, the end lag of down air prevented that from being able to happen. Kerbinell is impressive lead. Hits him with the Lariat. Once again, goes for an edge guard. So to get back to stage, that's wildly unsafe. However, Dawn fails to punish it. Um, that could potentially be huge. Uh, Kerbo hits him with the darkest area, isn't able to find a punish himself, and Falcon does something unsafe. Dawn 64 trying desperately to find a combo starter off of that Raptor boost side. He accidentally miss inputs a Falcon punch, where I assume he went for to go for a Raptor boost or a Falcon dive. In any sense, Kerbo absolutely dominated that first game. Um, taking, um, with, I believe that was a three stock. That was brutal. Uh, so, obvious things first, Don needs to work on his punishes, that was really bad, um, once he was able to get combo started, he managed to get some things done, he 
manage to get a bid percent on the table. However, finding those openings is very, very difficult. Um, usually against Incineroar, what you want to do is wait for him to do something wacky, then come in and punish. However, Don did not do that. He tried going for aggressive um, Raptor boosts, and that move, while it is good for blowing through things, is very, very unsafe, especially on shield. Um, and even a character as slow as Incineroar is going to be able to punish that, um, and especially on whiff. Raptor boost has a ton of ending lag, so even if it just misses the opponent, you're going to get a massive punish on Falcon. Granted, Kerbo wasn't able to get many of those punishes, however, he still got a few of them, where realistically, Don shouldn't have been using Raptor boost in positions where he could have potentially seen those punishes in the first place. Um, ideally, the way Don will want to play this um, is, like I said, mainly a whiff punishing game, because Captain Falcon does have very, very good optimized combos and can deal a ton of damage with extended conversions, um, especially against Incineroar, a character who takes less knockback, and while that does make him more survivable, it does mean that combos are going to deal less knockback and therefore be easier to string together and cover less space. It looks like here, though, Kerbo is going to switch to the Falcon. We're going to see a Captain Falcon ditto going into game two. Now both these characters are going to have the same game, Three, it's just going to be two, a matter one, of which go. player um, is able to implement it better. So Turbo does technically main this character, we are seeing him getting better conversions. So he goes for the positioning, he's able to Raptor boost back on the long stage, however, Brody goes for his own positioning, uh, predicts a... Um, I think it was a debate get-up prediction, however, he is able to blow through the get-up attack with this inputs the Falcon Punch, however, it trades with the Falcon Kick. Um, it goes for the Raptor Boost yet again. The Raptor Boost misses. Just barely misses the up Gets caught out. Don goes for the Falcon Punch. That is one of the worst moves um, in the game. It's very, very slow, and while it is strong, you're never going to be able to hit it. Um, and Kerbo hits with one of the main reasons Falcon Punch is outclassed. He's just that forward air knee. Um, a nickname the Knee of Justice. Um, that move is very, very strong in the sweet spot, which is essentially all the um, early of the move. Um, Kuro's at high percent, however, he does have a huge momentum lead, and momentum is huge for Falcon. Um, very hard to stop, and Dawn with the hard read, the one place where Falcon Punch can actually be usable. Um, as if you have a read on what your opponent's going to do, and that predictable recovery from Kerbo is going to cost in that stock. Almost any other punish could have worked there. However, he goes for the Falcon Punch. As we can see here, Falcon's force smash is not lacking in kill power. Kerbo immediately returning the favor, and taking um, a down second stock, tries to get the combo, and uses the Raptor boost in the air that in the ground that move may send upward, but in the air it spikes. Kerbo hits with two back-to-back -back, um damageless conversions. And finally, and gets the JV3 stock against Dawn64, taking the set 2 to 0.
All right, so there may be a bit of a lull in the action. Uh, we only have, I believe, one or two more sets to go today. Um, Sarah Benina fan is currently in the middle of it, and we should join after game one, and that might be the end of the set. Um, sets today, so uh, we'll just see how all that goes. Uh, we'll get back to you. Step into the ring! Alright, and for what should hopefully be the final time of this stream, we're going to be joining a game mid set. We have um, EB932 under the tag Ellis playing at Sarah Benita Fan. Um, EB did take the first game. Uh, however, we um, that game was, uh, I believe it was Byleth versus Cloud. So we'll see if we see character switch from anyone, and we are going to. We're going to see Sarah Benita Fan's Byleth change to Jiggly. A very, very different character. Um, instead of relying on high Three, damage space two, control, this character one, mainly wants go. to float around and whiff punish opponents with her excellent aerial mobility. Uh, most of her aerial attacks are very, very, very um, And while she may have somewhat underwhelming ground attacks, she has one absolute um, just Deus Ex of a move in rest. It's a frame 2 invincible, frame 2 hitbox active move which has several seconds of end lag. We might see it here. Uh, no, he's gonna go for force fashion instead with the um, side effect that he does an insane amount of knockback and can kill from incredibly early percents off the top. Um, this is going to be Jigglypuff's gun. And it's what we're going to be looking for. Jigglypuff has a couple other tools on his sleeve, mainly that same. We're going to be seeing, might be seeing Sarah use a lot of that. Um, a personal favorite of his. Um, the same will immobilize the opponent in sleep for a while. Um, it allows for a free punish, usually a fully charged smash attack. However, the opponent has to be grounded. It looks like he has a against it. Sarah takes the first stock. Uh, Jigglypuff does have a as you can see there. This character is very, very light. The second lightest character in the game means she takes the second most damage. She takes more. Pichu. 
Um, uh, Jigglypuff is also the floatiest character in the game. She has the lowest ball stop, which means that she flies off the top earlier than any other character. You can see here Eevee just wailing away at Sarah's game with that climb hazard. That is a frame 3 out of Shield Hop, which has invincibility at the top. I it has invincibility at the start as well. Um, but at the very least, um, it is very, very fast. It has good range, given the fact that it's a sword. Now, reverse force match is going to take that. Um, Sarah combos into the rest. We can see here there's a ton of knockback. Um, and puts a flat on the opponent's head, which deals damage over time. Uh, so that is going to give Sarah a bit of a, um, a easier time with this stock because he is now at an extremely high percent. He's trying to find an opening. He's trying to combo the bits of down air into a down smash, which is his fastest smash attack. It's not going to be enough. Cloud recovery is kind of missing something that Sarah could potentially exploit. Uh, Jalen Puff's edge guard is very, very good. And against a character like Cloud, who has very bad recovery, uh, she can potentially just forward air into the down smash again and again and just prevent you um, from being able to play the game once you get launched off. Sarah finally finding ways to punish against it. Um, that being said, Eevee also finding how to play to Sarah Sink, gets caught out by the Blade Gleam Limit Enhance. This is the, um, gimmick of Cloud. His limit, as you can see in the corner, will power up his smash attacks and, um, not smash attacks, his specials and changes physics. Um, Eevee making great use of smash attacks. Looks like he went for another up smash there. Trying to catch it out, however, Sarah's just narrowly managing to avoid it. Doesn't get caught out. He's barely avoiding these. If he gets hit by any of these, he's going to die. And Eevee knows this. Nice edge guarding. Gets caught up by the climb hazard once again. Hates out the thing. Hits him with the sing. This might be the. This is probably going to be the game. And that's going to be it. Sarah takes the second game after losing the first. The GB push a very, very close game, too. That was nerve wracking. Uh, if Sarah wants to win this set, though, he's going to have to play around Climb Hazard. That move is incredibly fast and is a very, very good out of shield option, with the one exception that on whiff and on shield it is very punishable. On hit, it's really good. However, you can it has a ton of lag on it because it puts Cloud into free fall. And if he does that downwards um, attack follow up, which is optional, um, it will increase the landing lag on it. Um, so while that will make it safer, it's still very, very unsafe, and Jigglypuff can potentially get a huge reward, especially considering the damage that Rest is able to do. Rest in general is going to be a very important tool for him in this matchup. Uh, we did see it hit him hit it once, it's very risky to go for, but there are some guarantee confirms into it. The main one is going to be the late hit of up air at certain percents into Rest. It's going That's going to work on, I believe, the entire cast. Um, and that is going to be a very, very early kill confirm that he can go for, especially because, as we see here, Eevee can somewhat um, struggle to punish Sing, which is one of Jimmy Puff's most punishable attacks, and in oftentimes is going to make the difference in the player matchup. If your opponent cannot punish Sing, it is an insanely powerful tool. If you can punish it, it's going to be an insanely weak tool. Uh, so a lot of this might also come down just how the each player punishes the spammable options of their opponent. Um, if EB manages to punish Sing, he's going to get a lot more openings to uh, potentially just get massive reward off of charge smash attacks um, and just general building limit. We saw him doing a bit of that earlier when he whiffed a Sing. Um, EB went back and just built up limit trying to get that um, 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 those limit attacks, which are going to be greatly enhanced and have greatly um, increased damage and knockback. And if Sarah can start punishing those unsafe climb hazards, you potentially get more openings for us. Uh, take stocks very, very quickly. Um, something else Sarah could work on is the edge guarding. We're going to battlefield here, so edge guarding is going to be a bit more difficult thanks to those platforms. It's going to allow um, you to retreat um, a bit more easily, go to those platforms, run off stage instead of just being forced to go back onto the stage um, itself. Okay, risk of aggression every EV um, uh, is going to be stuffing out a ton of options uh, with um, uh, that side pushing of his. That's going to have a huge hitbox, especially considering that Jigglypuff is a melee focused character. And as I mentioned earlier on the stream, uh, sword attacks are going to not have her boxes attached to them, which are the section of a character that can take knockback. Here we see the edge guarding from Sarah Vanita fan, as that's going to take EV's very first stock. 
Um, Cloud is a very, very bad recovery, and looks like Eevee is trying to kill Jillian off the top, which is a smart play. But it is a big advantage is going to be a recovery um, in almost polar contrast to Cloud. Um, she can make it back from nearly anywhere off stage, which makes her edge guarding very good, both because of her um, aerial attacks and because of the fact that she can make it from very long distances and can afford to take risks like that. Because for her, they aren't nearly as risky. Oh, goes for it. Forward smashes, it's the safer option. Um, Rush probably going to kill there. Put him in a lot more lag. Hits another one. Goes for another forward smash. Not able to fully charge it. That move can be matched out of and actually be able to keep the opponent in place at longer depending on how high their percent is. Looks like Eevee went for a finishing touch, which is the enhanced version of Cloud's down special. Um, it only does 1%, but it doesn't say knockback. However, as you can see here, it can get stuffed out and will still... Um, you don't it, even if the actual hitbox is going to be out. Catches him with a down air. Just going for another edge guard. Sarah Banana Fan in a very risky position. However, still has one stock on the shield. And absolutely decimating it. Nevi's left on one more stock as Sarah Banana Fan is still on his third. Granted, a very high percent. Nevi's Smash Dax could kill him, as we see there. Sarah Banana Fan now in a second. No longer has rage to take advantage of. That knockback multiplier, the higher your percent gets, is actually a character like Jigglypuff who can. Very, very quickly end your life with moves like rest. It looks like um, Cloud's not going to use a lot of Blade Beam. Um, has it on deck. Uses Limit Blade Beam. Goes for the up smash. Anti-air. It's really working. Sarah punishes with the rest. It looks like not going to go for a punish. He isn't able to find it. However, Sarah has to mind that shield. Jigglypuff has a unique mechanic where if shield um, is in the screen, Jigglypuff will actually just instantly die. will fly up into the blast zone and lose a stock. Sarah tries going for a sing above platforms, it doesn't work. Um, going for a barrage of anti air up smashes. Sarah's lead is looking a lot smaller. He has to close this out. The rollout, not a very good move, very risky and very punishable. Gets caught out by the um, blade beam. Goes for another sing, doesn't get it, doesn't get the punish either though. Goes for another sing, just narrowly avoids getting hit by it. Tries to up smash a return. However, it does get back aired off stage. This could potentially be it. Sarah doesn't go for an edge guard. Gets caught out. The pound trades with the blade beam. Once again, misses it. And the down air drag down into rest. That confirmed that he's been looking for the entire of the set. Sarah with the Jimmy Park counter pick is able to take the set two to one in a narrow comeback. That was close both games. All right, and that is going to be the last set of the day. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in to Week 7 of Varsity Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Singles for Photosage Esports, and we will catch you tomorrow for JV.